um, that dealt with the Iraq War, an analysis of how and why we got into the Iraq War. Um, and he was also in that film, appeared in it. He's also appeared in a couple of other films that we've screened. One was uh, Beyond Good and Evil uh, that we screened uh, back in uh, about the same period, uh, um, four or five years ago. Uh, and also he was in, if you remember, uh, he appeared in Peace, Propaganda, and the Promised Land. So as a uh, critical thinker, uh, his uh, reflections are sought by a number of people. He's published um, uh, articles in a number of, uh, I know, Common Dreams. I always read uh, his articles. Uh, 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 he's also an author of a number of books. His interests range from um, racism uh, to empire, the issues of empire uh, and pornography. There are a number of his books uh, right here on the table that you can buy and buy for your friends uh, uh, after the talk is over. Um, so, uh, and what he thinks about and what uh, he has to say is always of interest. Now, the, uh, the topic tonight, as he gave it to me, is celebrating the end uh, of the American dream. When I first saw the title, it reminded me of something George Carlin said, the late great comedian. He said, there's one thing that all the politicians know. It's called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. <laughs> now, I don't know if that has anything to do with what uh, Bob Jensen's gonna talk to us about tonight, but I do know that there's only one way to find out, so how about welcoming <laughs> Professor Robert Jensen. It is nice to be here. Uh, as Russell said, I was here several years ago. I get invited to speak in a lot of places, but I rarely get invited back. So this is a very nice <laughs> gesture on your, I have a lot of one-time speaking gigs, but uh, we are in a church and you know I'm from Texas, so you know I'm a godly man. And so I figured, you know, you just knew I'd come down. We do some testifying today, right? There's that kind of church, right? We're gonna, we'll have an altar call later. We'll bring some, we'll bring some souls to the Lord today, right? Brothers and sisters, can I get an amen? Amen. Oh, all right. Oh, it's not that. Oh, I forgot. You're Unitarians. Never mind. Let's dial that one back. Okay. Uh, because we're uh, in the middle of elections, uh, I thought it would be good to try and, and talk in a way that made reference to that, but I'm not going to talk really about the election. I'm not going to talk about the candidates. Uh, I'm, instead, I want to talk about this phrase that we hear so often during uh, election time, the American dream, and the implicit valorization of the, Amer the American dream is a good thing, we're told, and politicians love to promise how they're going to make it easier for people to reach the American dream. And as the title suggests, um, I'm going to be critical, not just of how the politicians might tell you we're going to get to the American dream, but of that concept of the American dream itself. Like most propagandistic phrases, it's very important, as Russell said, to apply a little critical thinking and ask what do we mean by it. Right. The concept of the American dream is used reflexively by almost everyone in the culture in a positive sense. And I want to step back and suggest we might critique that a bit. Uh, to do that, I want to make one thing clear, that the older I get, and you know, I, I have a lot of age and experience that you all should listen to here. <laughs> uh, but I, I did hit 50 this summer, and I think uh, that may not seem like old to some of you, but it's got me sort of thinking, perhaps in a slightly longer term framework. And as I do that, and, and whatever the idea, the institution, the practice that is on the table for evaluation, whatever it is I'm thinking about these days, I tend to evaluate it in light of two core criteria, justice and sustainability. That when I look at the world where the world's heading, I really ask only two questions of any idea that people pitch me that they tell me I should believe in, any institution people want me to endorse or be part of, 
any practice people want me to engage in, I always think of two things. Is it consistent with and will it enhance the level of justice in the world? And is it consistent with and will it enhance sustainability? And if the idea, the institution, or the practice is not consistent with those two principles, then I'm not much interested in it. Because I think we can all recognize we live in a profoundly unjust world, a world in which <clears throat> half the people in this, on this planet live on less than $2 a day. Half the people, more than 3 billion people by UN statistics live on less than $2 a day, the standard for poverty. About a quarter of the world's population lives on less than a dollar a day. All right, we live in a profoundly unjust world. The distribution of resources in this world is profoundly unjust. So we need to evaluate any idea, institution, or practice in light of justice. It's also, I think, a fundamentally unsustainable world in which we live. If you look at any indicator of the health of the ecosystem that makes life possible, whether it's the amount of topsoil available to grow food, groundwater contamination, toxic waste, the number and size of the dead zones in the world's seas. Every indicator of the health of the ecosystem which makes life possible is in decline. That means that sustainability has to be at the core. That is, there's, there's no way to, to defend a system that does not produce justice, and there's no sense defending systems that are not sustainable. So that's sort of background for everything I say. In the back of my mind are those two questions of justice and sustainability. So in that context, is the American dream consistent with justice and sustainability? As you can probably guess, I'm going to argue no, it is not. To do that, we have to start by asking, what is the American dream? Because like most propagandistic phrases, it survives on ambiguity, vagueness. You know, politicians and other people who would like us to follow them without thought love phrases that can be used without specificity, without justification. So the first question is to ask, what do we mean by it? You can't go to a dictionary to define it. There's no encyclopedia. And the American dream, I think, if we're going to understand how that phrase is used and understand what it means, we have to simply ask ourselves, how is it used when people offer it to us as a justification for something. And I've been thinking about that ever since Russell and I first started talking about this. And I think it really, there, there, of course, different people will have different ways to define it. But I think if we look at the common ways in which it's used, the American dream has two components, one political and one economic. And what I'd like to do for about the next half hour is look at those aspects of it offer some critique, and then make sure we have a lot of time for discussion afterwards in case anybody wants to argue with me. And as I look out over this audience, I suspect there will be some people who want to argue with me based on my last experience with this group. So that's a good thing. So the American dream has a political component and an economic component. Both are rooted in a conception, a core conception of freedom, especially the freedom to choose, freedom being defined as freedom of choice. So in the political realm, this freedom is supposed to produce liberty, right? the ability to live in a political system free from coercion, free from authoritarian domination. I think when people in the United States think about political freedom and the liberty it is supposed to construct, they really think primarily about two, um, two facets of that. One is the process of voting, representative government through elections, with the supreme moment being when you step into the voting booth. That, that, that freedom to choose means the freedom to choose your own representatives. We live in a large, complex, industrial society, 300 million people, certainly direct democracy, is impossible with 300 million people. Representation is inevitable. And so the, one of the core components of that political aspect of the American dream is the freedom to choose. And one of those aspects is the freedom to choose your representatives. Okay. The other, I think, is the freedom of expression. 
the understanding, as all theorists of democracy would agree, that if you have a system of representation, it's not a meaningfully democratic exercise unless you have freedom of expression. If people cannot come together and speak and publish their ideas, whatever the formal structure of representation, you don't really have a meaningfully democratic system. Therefore, you do not have the conditions necessary for liberty. So I think when people think about the American dream, they're thinking about freedom and that that freedom constructs a system that allows maximal liberty and that the core components of that are the freedom to choose your own representatives and the freedom to express yourself. And at that level of abstraction, I doubt anyone would argue much here in this room. We might have critical questions about what is the appropriate size of a political unit? Can you really have democracy with 300 million? There's all sorts of interesting and complex questions, but at the level I just laid it out, I don't think that's terribly controversial. Well, the economic component of the American dream is equally, I think, crucial to understanding the concept. And here again, we are told the American dream is rooted in this freedom to choose, this time to choose within a market-based capitalist system. And whereas in the political realm, the freedom produces maximal liberty, the freedom to choose in the economic sphere produces affluence, produces material comfort, and that that is part of the American dream as well. Now, there are many ways people would measure their material comfort and evaluate their affluence, but I think if you look at how we talk about it in this culture, there are two things that are at the core of this. One is the ability to purchase and live in a single family home. That's certainly evident here in the last month or so when the ability to live in, purchase and maintain the payments on a single family home is very much in, uh, in trouble. But I think that's one of the things at the core of this American dream, your own home. When you think about it, you know, owning your own home. In the world I came out of, the, the, it wasn't so much, I grew up in, in a small town in North Dakota. Well, all the towns in North Dakota are small. I actually grew up in the biggest city in North Dakota, which had about as many people as, oh, a couple of square blocks of Brooklyn, perhaps, right? <laughs> so, uh, but there weren't a lot of super rich, you know, there were no Donald Trumps running around Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, the difference in our world was between those families that owned their own home and those that were forced to rent, and we looked on those people who were forced to rent with a certain amount of sympathy. Even though I myself didn't come from a wealthy family, we always were able to have our own house. That was really the marker of the American dream. You had your own house. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense here where renting, where the, the mark of the dream is a rent controlled apartment, but uh, you have to put yourself in, in another realm. The other aspect of this economic component of the American dream, I think, is the ability to take vacations. When you think about it, when people talk about when they've made it, what does that mean? It means you can own your own home and you can take a vacation. You can go somewhere for that period in which you are not enslaved in corporate capitalism, the practice of wage slavery, and you can go somewhere where all you do is relax, right? unless you're a parent, in which you go somewhere <laughs> and your stress levels just increase a little bit. So, Again, I, I'm obviously taking this vague, ambiguous phrase, the American dream, which does not have a single dictionary definition. It's used in the, in the, the world of electoral politics, uh, but it's used in some way that we all recognize. After all, if a phrase is too vague or ambiguous, then it has no value. Politicians love those phrases somewhere between the rigidly defined where they're accountable for how they use it and a phrase that has no meaning. And I think the American dream is one of those phrases in the middle. And I think that we could discuss whether or not I've captured the, the essence of the American dream in these two dimensions, the political, the economic, and then in each of those two kind of core markers. But I think by virtue of looking out and seeing people nod, that what I've said doesn't seem crazy, that this does sort of capture at least some aspects of this American dream. So what I'd like to do now is, is 
for the purposes of discussion, let's say we can agree that this is what we mean when the phrase American dream is used in public. So let's go on to then critique it and ask some critical questions about where the American dream leads and whether or not we need to rethink it. <laughs> so what I'm arguing is the American dream is presented as a combination of democracy and capitalism. That really the American dream is this marriage of democracy as we understand it in the contemporary modern world and capitalism. And on the first of those two, I, I just want to make it clear, I, I'm, going, I'm not going to argue against democracy. I believe that democracy is a value we should support. I don't think, again, that's terribly controversial. Uh, once one starts asking difficult questions about how to make democracy real in the world, of course, one gets into debates. But as a core value, I don't think we have to worry too much about democracy. So it's really the capitalism part of it that I think we need to come to terms with. The problem in the American dream is not in the, the valorizing of democracy, but that the assumption that democracy and capitalism can be married to create a dream. And what I'm going to argue is that, in fact, trying to bring those two systems together is not a dream, but is the planetary nightmare that we are now facing. So let's look again first then at the political realm. And here, let's bring in this question of justice. It's understood that democracy is supposed to create a just society. Uh, well, we have to start talking now about what we mean by democracy. And there are long and often acrimonious debates within political theory about that. But again, recognizing where I'm at, I'm going to offer a definition of democracy that I don't think will be terribly controversial. I think the core concept in democracy is the notion that ordinary people, as folks like us, not simply the elite, that ordinary people have a meaningful role in the formation of public policy. That ordinary people have a meaningful role in the formation of public policy. That is, as we decide collectively how to deal with public policy questions, questions of taxation, of war and peace, of how to structure an educational system, all of those things that we consider to be in the realm of the collective decision-making process, that ordinary people should have a role not simply in selecting the elites that will make those decisions, but in the formation of the public policy that themselves. That a system is meaningfully democratic when that, that condition is met. The argument I'm going to make, which is hardly new and hardly unique to this conversation, is that, in fact, capitalism undermines democracy. Now, in some settings, one has to, first of all, dispel the notion that that statement qualifies you for the insane asylum. Because in much of contemporary American culture, not only is cap are capitalism and democracy assumed to be uh, consistent with each other, in fact, democracy is fused with capitalism. And in fact, market-based capitalism is often asserted as the ultimate achievement of an embodiment of democracy. This would be the, the line that Milton Friedman, the late economist, and all of the acolytes who follow would, would take. That in fact, democracy, it, it's not that democracy and capitalism are consistent. It's that capitalism is democracy. But in fact, I would argue it's quite clearly exactly the opposite. That in fact, capitalism, if by capitalism we mean the organization of the economy that we live with today, right, especially now in its corporate form, a, a predatory late corporate capitalism, <clears throat> that in fact it is fundamentally inconsistent with democracy and therefore is fundamentally unjust. I don't think that's a terribly controversial statement, because whatever capitalism is in economics 101 <coughs> classrooms and in the writings of Milton Friedman or the imagination of other borderline psychotics, whatever capitalism is there, in reality, capitalism is and always has, be, has been a wealth concentrating system. Capitalism concentrates wealth. That's the way that system works. That's the way it was devised and that's the way 
it has continued to be. That concentration of wealth will vary at different times and places depending on the ability of ordinary people to resist that concentration. So when you look at the, the movement from the 1930s through the early 1970s in the United States, consistent with the, the, most, uh, the period where, where labor unions had the most power in the 20th century, the concentration of wealth was quite extreme in this country, but that wealth was being distributed downward more than it had in the past. In the 1970s, that wealth concentration began to dramatically increase again. So the degree of concentration of wealth in capitalism will vary, but in fact, capitalism is a wealth concentrating system. And when you concentrate wealth, you concentrate power. Uh, if someone has a historical example of a period when wealth is concentrated but power is distributed, that is where the concentration of wealth does not affect the concentration of power, that is where the economic does not affect the political, I would be interested to hear it. I don't know of such uh, an example in all of recorded human history. So capitalism concentrates wealth, and when you concentrate wealth, you concentrate power, which means, by definition, you undermine democracy because democracy is about the distribution of power equally. Right. Now, that may say, I'm looking around, and, and again, some of you are as old as I am or older, and you've lived through some of these historical periods, and this is not a hard sell. But remember, we live in a world where the ideological landscape is very different. And for instance, my students at the University of Texas 18 years old, have been raised in a world which fundamentally denies that. The first step you have to do with, with those kids is get them to recognize that the economic system affects the political system because they've been raised to think of these as two separate spheres. You take economics over here, you take political science over here, and never the twain shall meet. As if somehow the distribution of wealth in a culture has nothing to do with the formation of politics. Yet, intuitively, from our experience, we know it does. The way I always illustrate this is to say, okay, one person, one vote in America, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And you all have free speech, right? Yeah, we have free speech. Say anything we want. All right. So you, I point to a student in class of ordinary means, you have the right to vote and you have the right to speak freely, correct? Correct. Here's Bill Gates. How many votes does Bill Gates get when he goes into the voting booth? One, one person, one vote. Bill Gates has the right to speak freely, no different than your right to speak freely. Therefore, in this system, you and Bill Gates have equal political power or access to political power, correct? And they all say, well, no, of course not. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's almost a self-evident proposition. The reason I'm exercising this argument here, when I don't think most of you need to be convinced of it, is it is an argument that needs to be made over and over again in a world that is subject to really quite incredible levels of propaganda, including through the school system. Right. So the American dream, which marries capitalism and democracy, in fact, there is problem number one. It cannot meet the criteria of justice because capitalism will concentrate wealth, it will concentrate power, it will undermine justice, and in the the situation in the world today where half the world's population lives on less than $2 a day is a predictable consequence of that system. It is not an accident. It is not an unfortunate byproduct of. It is the predictable consequence of that system. And if you live in a world where half the world's population lives on $2 a day, that half of that population is going to have, to say the least, a very difficult time participating in a democratic society. It's very hard to become politically active when you are starving, right? So I think that we can see that the capitalism side of the American dream already creates an inherent problem for the American dream's own claim to political freedom, creating the maximal liberty. It's not that we don't vote, we do. I will vote, I wanna make it clear. I come from the political left, but I do vote. Right? And I encourage other people to vote. I also encourage people not to overestimate you know, the effect of voting. I also I spent my whole adult life as either a journalist or an academic, and I'm also actively engaged in political organizing. So I take freedom of expression very seriously. I'm glad that the expansive guarantees of freedom of expression in this culture exist. 
and I try to utilize them. So I'm not arguing against voting or against freedom of expression, but we have to evaluate these concepts and the practice of them in some realistic way. And we see that the American dream immediately begins to flounder. Well, what about the second component of this, the economic again? The American dream has a political component and an economic component. I'm arguing the American dream, this marriage of capitalism and democracy, immediately we see the problem in the political. What about in the economic? Well, again, I think what I'm about to say is uh, readily self-evident, yet needs to be asserted over and over again in a culture subject to so much intense propaganda. But I don't think it's a terribly controversial s statement to say that capitalism, especially contemporary consumer capitalism, is fundamentally unsustainable. Right? This is, again, a rather simple argument. The last time I looked at the economics textbooks, capitalism is based on a notion of unlimited growth. And the last time I looked at the world, it is a finite planet. You cannot have a system of unlimited growth in a finite ecosystem unless you indulge in sort of fantasies of what I call technological fundamentalism, the belief that you can invent your way out of the reality of that ecosystem. So the political system that comes from this marriage of democracy and capitalism, I'm arguing is fundamentally unjust. And the material system that comes out of capitalism is fundamentally unsustainable. Therefore, the American dream fails the two criteria that matter to me these days, producing a world that is more just and producing a world that is more, that is eventually one can hope sustainable. Therefore, I conclude that the American dream should be scrapped. <laughs> That it's one of those concepts that needs to be buried, not worked with, redefined, but scrapped. That we are politically better off if instead of trying to say to ourselves, well, you know, okay, the American dream, there's some problems with it, but it's a powerful concept in the culture, and therefore we should work to redefine it. I'm going to argue, in fact, we should work to destroy it. That we should no longer play with the concept, we should, in fact, come out against it. I'm against the American dream. Okay. <laughs> now, if I were running for, oh, pick an office, governor of Texas, I'm not suggesting this would be a winning political strategy. <laughs> I'm not saying that if I were auditioning for a role as um, a, a host of a new talk show on CNN, that this would be a winning political strategy. Right? I'm suggesting that for those of us who want to take seriously the, the depth of the crises, the multiple crises we face today, and those are crises that I think are not only political and economic, but are cultural and ecological and therefore are profoundly spiritual, that we need to start telling the truth about the world we live in. Not because it's going to turn around the political system tomorrow, Truth be told, I don't think there's anything that's going to turn around this political system tomorrow. Right? I think we need to dig in for the long haul and recognize that, in fact, that is the time frame and the train on which we have to struggle. That we have to, in fact, redefine the world in which we live. That the system we live in today, this product of a certain historical trajectory, which is not only about the development of democracy, the development of capitalism, the development of a certain kind of connection between human beings and themselves, human beings and each other, and human beings and the non-human world. Right? Three ways to think about who we are. What is our relationship to self? What is our relationship to others? What is our relationship to the non-human world? On all of those levels, I think when one tells the truth about the systems in which we live, it becomes clear we have to transcend those systems. And that is not a short-term political project. It is a long-term project. It does not mean there is no short-term political work worth doing. 
It does not mean we should abandon anti-war work. It does not mean we should abandon work for racial justice. It does not mean we should give up on feminism. All of these are components of building a different kind of world. But in addition to whatever the short-term policy focus that might sort of animate us at the moment, right? I'm arguing we have to keep an eye on this larger struggle. And it may mean, in fact, I think it does mean we have to start using different terms and start marking the terms that currently define politics as unacceptable. And I think the American dream is one good place to start. If nothing else, you must grant me this. It's a great conversation starter, all right? I look out and I suspect you all come from a variety of social, cultural kinds of places. But imagine the next dinner party that you're at and people say, well, what do you think about X? And you say, well, you know, you find a way to work it in. I just think we have to finally destroy the American dream. Wouldn't that be a great conversation starter at a dinner party? Now, for me, I must admit, this is somewhat hypothetical because I don't actually get invited to dinner parties anymore. <laughs> I used to get invited to people's homes for parties. It's been a while since I've been, and I don't know if there's a correlation between the types of conversations I try to start and the frequency of the invitations, but I do know they have dropped off considerably in recent years. But I, I um, compensate for that by throwing dinner parties of my own. And in fact, <clears throat> in the, the dinner parties I do throw, and in fact, I, I have been doing a lot of this because what's underneath a lot of what I'm talking about is the need to expand our conception of the political. Right? That politics, yes, happens in electoral context. Yes, it happens in movement building, but politics also happens in our day-to-day -day lives. And one of the things that the group of people I work with in Austin has been doing is trying to create social space where people can actually have these conversations. And since nobody invites me to their house, I invite everybody to my house. And because I cook, they're willing to come and put up with this. <laughs> but in actual uh, experience, uh, I think people are hungry for this. I don't mean the majority of the population at this point, but I think people who have an, a kind of intuitive sense that we are not just going through one more cyclical downturn that will rise out of and the stock market will war back and our 401ks will come back and we'll start thinking about buying SUVs again soon. I, I think there's an a expanding group of people who recognize we are in systems in permanent decline and that the cyclical downturns are part of a larger trend down. So you cyclical downturns heading ever closer to that bottom. And in that world, people, I think, actually are hungry for this kind of conversation. And I think they see the contradictions in the system. For instance, let's go back to talking a bit about capitalism. This is a moment where in a, in a society that takes capitalism to be a given, right? And that's where we sit right now. Capitalism in this culture is not an economic system we have chosen. It is presented as a state of nature. It is a given. It is the so-called end of history. There is no more. The titanic struggle between socialism and capitalism is over, right? That's the way it's presented. Right? Yet these contradictions now, especially with this recent financial meltdown, are readily evident, and we can talk about that. So for instance, here's one that's quite obvious and very useful in trying to start these discussions. We were told, everybody who took economics, you might remember, what is the engine that drives capitalism? Well, it's greed, yes? It's the human desire to, to maximize your own self-interest. That's rational, yes? Right? People are greedy, right? How many of you have ever done anything greedy? I have, yes, yeah, see, proof, people are greedy, okay? Now, we also have a set of moral principles and intuitions that say, well, Greed is also not the best part of our nature. It's part of human nature, no doubt about it. But we also have a long-standing set of traditions that say it's not necessarily a part of human nature to encourage. So what's the moral theory behind capitalism? Well, if everybody acts out of that natural inclination toward greed, 
then the invisible hand of the market produces the greatest good. You've heard this. You've all been through, you know, the, the propaganda exercise we call introduction to economics. <laughs> all right, so greed is good, yes? This was memorialized in, in that famous movie in the 1980s, Wall Street, in which William Doug, or not William, what's his name? Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas's, you know, ultimate Wall Street huckster character proclaims greed is good. And he's really not saying anything radical. He's articulating, in fact, the theory behind capitalism. All right. Now, greed is good, yet in the financial meltdown we're seeing, every politician, including George Bush, is saying, what caused the financial meltdown? Greed. greed. Wall Street greed. Uh, uh, <laughs> Wait now, greed is good. No, no, greed is bad. Well, which is it, right? Is greed good? Is it the engine that makes all of this miracle possible? Or is it the corrosive human quality that undermines the system? It can't be both, right? The same thing cannot be both the great miracle engine of a system and the, the element that destroys the system, right? So there is this moment where we can, I think, raise these questions. There's also, I think, to again speak to this hunger that I feel, and I think a lot of other people feel, if we look around, we say, okay, here's the American dream. Look what it's produced. It's produced the most powerful country in the history of the world, which it has. There is no country that's ever been able to exercise power around the world like the United States. And it's the most affluent country in the history of the world. The level of material comfort in this country is unsurpassed in human history. Even with our problems, we remain the largest economy in the world and in the history of the world. We live at a level that is, was unimaginable through most of human history. When you just look at the mark, things like the amount of calories we take in, all, even people of relatively modest means in the United States live at a level beyond most of the world and certainly beyond most of what human beings throughout history have experienced. Right? So we live at, in this country that is supposed to be the sort of the height of. Yet if you ask people how they feel about their lives, right? how do you feel about your job in a corporate setting? How do you feel about the political system and what kind of choices it really gives you? Right? What do you hear from people? Right? What I hear is a sense of isolation often, a sense of depoliticization, a sense of alienation, right? fragmentation, the, the way in which we feel often that our work keeps us engaged in activities we're not sure are all that valuable in the first place, leaving us exhausted at the end of a day. We live in communities, if we have the material means to do so, that instead of bringing together, fragment and isolate people. Right? We live in a cultural system that encourages our most meaningful moments to be in connection with a screen <laughs> instead of other human beings. If you actually talk to people about how they feel about these things, in fact, this supreme achievement in human history, the American dream, the merger of democracy and capitalism has, in fact, produced a world in which people feel profoundly disconnected, disengaged, and disturbed. Well, it seems to me that is fertile ground for political organizing. Right? Again, it, is not, it doesn't mean that the majority of people, I think, are ready to move from that feeling, that intuition, to political action that will fundamentally change the nature of the system, but I think it is the ground in which we can start to talk at this level. And I think we have to talk at this level. And if we do, the first thing to ask people is, okay, what part of the American dream is it that you want to save? That is, what aspects of this dream do you really think are valuable? And there you can start to tease out how real democracy, meaningful freedom, is in fact a value. And then you can start to say, okay, if the institutions in which we live don't deliver that to us, 
what can we do? And when people immediately say, well, there's nothing you can do, we just have to make the best of this, you can say, well, that strikes me as a profound failure of imagination. Mm -hmm. right? We're supposed to be imaginative, inventive, hardworking people, yet you've just agreed that the systems we live in do not produce the outcomes you want consistent with, consistent with the values you hold, and yet you're telling me nothing can be done. Well, that just strikes me as, in a kind of ironic sense, a fundamental abandonment of the American dream in the sense that that dream has always been articulated as the ability to do anything. Ask them, we're Americans, you know. What do we, when Americans have a problem, what do we do? You, you damn right, they're sure that's right. We, we roll, except you gotta roll up your sleeves first. Sure. Get them <laughs> sleeves up a little more. You lift the hood of the car, you get Ross Perot with his flip charts, and you f flip those charts, and you fix that problem. We want to send a man to the moon, what do we do? What do we do, ma'am? We, yeah, damn right, send a man to the moon. Okay, so you've got this, this you, you can start to point out to people that capitulation to the nightmare side of the American dream is actually an abandonment of those parts of the American dream that might, in fact, be worth saving. But I would go beyond that, and I think um, to, to sort of reflect the, the book I wrote called Citizens of the Empire, The Struggle to Claim Our Humanity, I think that rhetorically there's an even better place to go. When, when one points out the contradictions inherent in this American dream, to talk about why, in the first place, did we ever call it the American dream? Right? Because every moral system that guides our lives, and I don't care if one is working from a secular, philosophical point of view, or from a religious tradition, or way out on the fringes, even the Unitarians, right? I think all of the <laughs> meaningful philosophical and theological traditions in our lives, all have at their core some conception of the inherent dignity of all people and the centrality of equality. Right? In the Christian tradition, it's the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There are similar declarations in Judaism, in Islam, in the, the, the categorical imperative of Kant. All of, all of our systems tell us that, in fact, it doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what your nationality is, race and ethnic. We are all part of a human family. And if there is a human family, why is there an American dream? Right? Why would you dream a dream only for people born within the boundaries of an arbitrary nation state? So in fact, is it not an opportunity to say the problem with the American dream is not just how we have constructed it, but that we have labeled it as a an American dream. And why can we not talk then of a human dream? A dream of, in fact, being human, becoming human, that process of becoming human in a world that I think many of us have a, a sense is profoundly anti-human. That the systems we live in, in fact, don't enhance our capacity to be fully human, they often retard it. And so can we start talking about a human dream, a dream that is consistent with justice, not only within the boundaries of our nation state, but worldwide? If we are part of that human family, then we all know morally that what happens to my child is no different than what happens to a child in sub-Saharan Africa. Right? We know that at some level, we know that has to be true. How can we construct a human dream that is consistent with sustainability. That is not only trying to create a world in which there is a distribution of wealth and power that achieves something that we could call rough justice, but that would also be sustainable so that future generations can live in that just world as well as us. That's also part of the philosophical inheritance, no matter what our system. Leaving aside end time Christians who believe in fact sustainability is not really relevant because the rapture is coming to lift us all up. So if you bracket out people who are, for lack of a better term, delusional, which is what I think that is. And I don't say that just to be sarcastic. I think that is delusional thinking. I think it actually, to, to digress a bit, I think that end time Christianity, the rapture, revelation, I think it's responding 
to a recognition that we're in trouble, but responding to it in a delusional fashion. We should pay attention to it for what it tells us about the world we live in, uh, but not be afraid to mark it, in fact, as delusional. That means we're gonna, we have a lot of work. We have to figure out how to, in a sense, I think the political project for the next 50 years, if we have that long, is to learn how to live locally in a world defined by the universal. Because ecologically we know you don't live universally, you live locally, you live in a watershed, you live in a local ecosystem, and we have to figure out ways to, to re regain some of the harmony with which the human species traditionally lived before agriculture. All right. So that is a local project. That means thinking about local water, local food, local energy. Right. It, means about, it means looking to, for ways to get in right relation with nature, to use a theological phrase. But it also has to be at a universal level because we all know that the distribution of resources in the world now is conditioned on especially 500 years of imperial domination emanating primarily from Europe and the United States, which has dramatically skewed the resources available to people. So it's not enough to just dial back and say, okay, we're gonna figure this out locally. We have a moral obligation to do that in the context of justice at the universal. These are not easy tasks in a culture in which a huge percentage of the population still in the face of this is trying to figure out how to return to the American dream that will allow them unlimited credit at Circuit City, Best Buy, and the local car dealership. So we do have a lot of work to do. What I want to end with, and then open it up to discussion, is uh, an old friend of mine, uh, well, I should rephrase that, a friend of mine who was very old and who I only met recently, uh, Nidhi and I were talking about him earlier, uh, a man named Abe Oshiroff. And the reason I want to talk about Abe is not because, because Abe had the answers. Uh, as he got older, and in fact, the last time I saw him right before his death at age 92 uh, this spring, Abe was more, I think, clear than ever that, that he didn't have answers. What he had was a way of being in the world that he thought was consistent with this struggle for a just and sustainable world. <coughs> Abe Oshroff, uh, was born in, in Brooklyn 92 years ago. Uh, he was well known as one of the last living veterans of the Spanish Civil War from the, the international brigades, which many of you know about. One of the few times in human history where people left their own country to fight for a revolution in another country. We also know that revolution failed, the fascist takeover of Spain heralded a very uh, dark period in human history. Uh, Abe survived that service in the Spanish Civil War, came back to the United States, and for the remainder of his life was engaged in some form of progressive left radical politics. He was a longtime member of the Communist Party, as were in fact almost all of the internationals who fought. It's part of history we find obscured because it's inconvenient to remember that often members of the Communist Party were at the forefront of struggles for social justice because that party has been demonized, and in some ways rightly so, for its failures. Like many people, Abe left the Communist Party in the 1950s over uh, so the, the increasing understanding that the Soviet Union was not the workers' paradise it had been presented. And he became, he never lost his fundamental left principles, his concern for justice, but he went forward in the world then engaged in politics in a less dogmatic and doctrinaire form, and I think more open to the experience of the world. He was a very charismatic fellow, uh, and throughout his life always managed to find ways to use that sort of larger than life personality uh, in the service of others. Uh, he, uh, he was a professional carpenter by training, and he often used those skills. He spent time in Mississippi in, in 1964, helping to build a community center. He uh, took a delegation down to Nicaragua in the 1980s to build housing as part of a political project. He was always involved in anti-war work, either very publicly or privately. He did community organizing against 
wealthy developers in California. Uh, and till the end of his life, even when he was physically fairly immobile and in considerable pain, never really quit. The last big project of Abe's was the Peace Mobile. Right? He, was, he, he had back problems, back surgery, he really couldn't move very easily. So he thought, well, hell, I'll just buy a van, we'll outfit it with loudspeakers and art, and then I'll just drive around yelling at people. <laughs> uh, but that was the way Abe was. He never stopped thinking, how can I make a contribution? How can I use the particular configuration of skills that I have to do that? But underneath it all, what really, I think, drew people to Abe, and people were always drawn to Abe, was a kind of openness, a recognition that he always had something to learn. And the way that Abe talked about his own politics uh, was very simple. He never referred to himself as a socialist anymore. Or he, he said, I believe in a radical humanism. And that would then lead to people saying, well, what does that mean? And he would define it in different ways in different times and places. But when I think about the conversations I had with Abe, which were some of the most meaningful conversations I've had in recent years, uh, that really what was at the core of Abe's philosophy was very simple. You, you reject any system based on hierarchy, which inevitably then will lead to exploitation. You're always in resistance to those systems. And that's a nice abstraction. And Abe would say that what that really is based on is a, a, an old-fashioned concept of solidarity. Right? And then, of course, people would say, well, what's solidarity, especially these days? Um, and Abe's response was solidarity is love in action. I always found that an extremely eloquent way to think about politics. That solidarity, he would say, is love in action. And then we'd say, okay, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and he would talk about projects as a way, the projects he had worked on, that in his life he had tried to put love into action. But he also talked a lot about authenticity. And he said, the way you know you're on the right track is when you have the experience of authenticity. Right? That even when you, you know, these sort of abstractions about radical humanism and resistance to hierarchy and solidarity and love, and, they're all well and good, but that doesn't tell you how to be in the world. And he said that he had learned that the most sort of honest and accurate guide was this sense of authenticity, which of course would leave me to say, well, what does that mean? So I, I, I actually did a very long interview with Abe, which I edited down and is on the web. And if you search on Google for Abe Osheroff and my name, it'll, it'll come up. And in that interview, he said, uh, I, I don't, because there's a camera running, I don't want to give you the, the actual way Abe would have spoken, because every other word was an obscenity that would have to be bleeped out of any <laughs> public broadcast of this. But, Abe said, oh, authenticity, he acknowledged that authenticity was a word bandied about much too freely, right? especially in a world of advertising, where advertisers are always telling you they're about to sell you the authentic goods, <laughs> the authentic service. He said, he said, actually, authenticity is a very easy concept to understand. He said, you, you feel authentic. You have the experience of authenticity, he said, when what you think and what you say and what you do are cut from the same cloth. He said, we all think things. And he said, often we don't say what we think. And when we say what we think, we don't always act on it. And he said, an authentic moment is when what you think leads to what you say, leads to what you do, when you are in sync that way. And he said, when you are authentic, you know it. He said, you feel it deep in your gut. And he said, it is the most intensely pleasurable experience in the world. Right? And it is a guide. Now, Abe would have been the first to say that by, by naming that as a, a, a pleasurable experience in some way, it doesn't mean that all our lives, when we are authentic, are fun and games because Abe also realized in a system structured on so much hierarchy, so much exploitation, that to be authentic often put you in direct conflict with that system and the people in those systems. So he knew that 
authenticity was not uh, always going to, to leave you in a place where you would be happy. But that if one wanted to take seriously the notion of radical humanism, if one wanted to take seriously the notion of solidarity, if one wanted to really try to be in the world in a way that allowed you to take the abstract concept of love and put it into action, that there would be a reward for that. And the reward was that feeling of authenticity in connection to other human beings, but that there would also be costs. And where I want to end is, is actually not with the words from Abe, but words from uh, Dostoevsky's novel, novel, The Brothers Karamazov, which I've never actually read. But when you cite these kind of books, it makes you look really smart. <laughs> but then I immediately undermine it and say, I, don't know, I never read the damn thing. <laughs> There's a lot of the classics I never read, you know. Um, as Wendell Berry, Wendell Berry, the, the farmer and writer, once said, I, I heard a talk he gave, and somebody asked him if he'd read a particular book. And he said, no, that's one of the millions of books I've never read. Right? Uh, this is one of the millions of books I've never read. But another, uh, I think, really inspiring figure in history, uh, in some ways very much a contemporary of Abe's, uh, Dorothy Day, the, the radical activist and, uh, at, at the heart of the Catholic worker movement. Dorothy Day used to quote this particular line from Dostoevsky. And so this is me piggybacking on Dorothy Day. And she, she used to cite this to remind us that if one takes seriously the moral principles that we hold or that we claim to hold, that if we take seriously the need to move from an articulation of moral principles to a living of those principles, that in fact, as Abe understood also, there would be costs. And Dorothy Day used to frequently quote this line, which I think sums up where we sit today as we try to tell the truth about things like the American dream. Dorothy Day would say to audiences to remember that love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared with love in dreams. And when we talk about the American dream, I think we need to remember that to make good on our own principles requires that solidarity, that love in action. And as Dorothy Day pointed out, and in fact, I think provided, much like Abe, a rather inspiring life to help us when we falter ourselves, love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. Thank you. <clears throat> um,